I mean, Ismay's father was Thomas Ismay, who was your classic uh, bootstrapping, uh, hard knuckle businessman. He basically bought the bankrupt White Star Line in the 1860s on a, you know, for nothing, uh, for a, a thousand pounds. And he um, partnered with a gentleman named Gustav Christian Schwabe, who was actually a converted Jew from Hamburg. And they partnered together to both build the White Star Line and uh, the Harlan Wolf shipping line. So this was a symbiotic business. So, uh, and also Schwab's nephew was named uh, Wolf and that was the Wolf of, of Harlan and Wolf. So actually Harlan and Wolf actually has a German Jewish connection as does the White Star Line. But Ismay built this company from the ground up and he introduced um, you know, great luxury and first class. But, his ships are also big steerage carriers, and he was um, absolutely a ruthless man. I think it was very tough on his son, Bruce. Titanic Talk with Nelson Aspen and Alexandra Boyd. Here we feature stories from the independent documentary Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries and everything to do with the iconic ship. From James Cameron's epic groundbreaking movie, to the history and legacy of Titanic herself. Actors, historians, authors, descendants and fans come here to talk about Titanic. This is your first class ticket to everything aboard the Ship of Dreams. This is Nelson Aspen with Alexander Boyd for Titanic Talk. But before we go to our regularly scheduled podcast today, we did want to acknowledge the passing of John Landau. We wouldn't have Titanic Talk if it weren't for the 1997 version of Titanic. That wouldn't have, uh, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have uh, had Alexander's wonderful documentary, Ship of Dreams, which led to Titanic Talk and the wonderful community of friends that, that we have as a result of that. So uh, we wanted to take a moment and honor him and Alexandra having worked with him on said Titanic. Uh, what are your fondest recollections? Well, um, he was a giant in the industry. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, not, not only is his legacy Titanic, but the Avatar movies as well. And his, um, his collaboration and his professional relationship with James Cameron for 31 years was, was outstanding and i think he's probably an example of doing few things really well rather than scatter gunning you know movies across uh, across our screens for as as long as he was working but he was always he always stood out on set because he had very um colorful jumpers uh, sweaters as the americans would say uh, mis like missoni like i think they were missoni jumpers so <laughs> you could always spot john in the crowd and he was just always charming and jolly and I think just genuinely loved being there. As you imagine some of the stresses and the money that was evaporating in front of him as the producer, he still had the most congenial outlook. And then um, the day after they all won all the Oscars, 11 Oscars, um, I I had John's telephone number and on my landline, we love to talk about our landlines, pre <laughs> mobile. Uh, I called and left a message on the voicemail to say congratulations and how terribly proud I was to have been even a tiny part of the film and how exciting it was. We had a bunch of the actors over to my house to watch the telecast and it was really exciting. So I just left a congratulations voicemail and he called me back to thank me for my voicemail. <laughs> Who does that when you've just won so 11 sweet. Oscars? He must have been on the phone for two days thanking people for congratulating him. Yeah. Well, and we knew he was uh, he was a fan of Ship of Dreams as well. Um, he so, did get uh, to see it. Yes, he, he did. He, he is got still to see part it. of and forever will be part of our Titanic talk community. And what I think what I loved in one of the obituaries I read is that he said he believed that film was the ultimate human art form. And that just goes to show you that he had a passion for what he did. We all have a passion for what we do. And if we don't, you should. So let that be his legacy. Well, rest in peace, John. Amen.
I'm Nelson Aspen, and I'm so excited to be back with another episode of Titanic, Titanic Talk. I'm so excited I can't talk, but at least there's Titanic Talk to talk about. I um, did not go to Harvard University, but I married into a family. Uh, I married someone who did go to Harvard University, and one of the perks of that marriage is getting a membership to the Harvard Club. They have very distinguished and esteemed speakers there, in addition to great wine and pretty good steak. So um, I wanted to attend. Attend. Um, this gentleman's speaking engagement wasn't able, but better, I got him as a guest on Titanic Talk. I'd like you to meet Stephen Ujifusa, who has written one of the best books I've read this year, The Last Ships from Hamburg, Business, Rivalry, and the Race to Save Russia's Jews on the Eve of World War I. Welcome to Titanic Talk, Stephen. Nelson Alexandra, thank you so much for having me. The book is extraordinary, and I... I I will say, uh, as, as it, it tells the story of Eastern European Jewish immigration to America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the second exodus, Publishers Weekly rightfully called it one of the best books of the year. I agree. And there is a very big Titanic connection. And in fact, there is a chapter called uh, The Martyrs of the Titanic. So let's just start with what your initial... Uh, interest, how were you piqued uh, in your interest of steamships and notably Titanic? Well, this book was sort of a coming home for me as an historian. Uh, my grandmother uh, told me the story of the Titanic when I was around six years old, and she grew up in Brooklyn. She was the daughter of Jewish immigrants from the Russian Empire. And she highlighted the story of Isidore and Ida Strauss. And my grandma was born in 1916, four years after the Titanic went down. But apparently the story of the Strausses, how this German Jewish couple who were immigrants themselves to America had made it in the new world. He was the co-owner of Macy's department store, uh, how he and his wife didn't part uh, when she could have gotten a lifeboat and left, how they didn't part. And when she famously said, we've been living together for many years where you go, I go, so we live, so we will die together. Uh, that story, um, resonated throughout the Jewish community, not just in New York, but through the world, of how this couple uh, stayed together uh, in the face of death. So that's how I got interested in history, in shipping, and writing this book, uh, The Last Ships from Hamburg, was an examination of where my own mother's family came from, why they came to this country. Uh, and they were fleeing pogroms, persecution, military conscription, at a vicious level in the Russian Empire. Um, but also, this book was revisiting a figure I've written about earlier, who is famous to many steamship um, lovers, uh, Albert Ballin, who was the managing director of the Hamburg America Line, and a German Jew himself, who arguably brought more immigrants to this country than any other single person. And you also say he was now sort of known as the the father of modern cruise ship travel. So I mean, we're we're still uh, we're still living off of uh, some of Ballin's uh, work and and dreams and missions and and things like that. But Alexander and I have talked about this before: how such a a, a monumental tragedy as the Titanic spawned so many positive things. Your love. For history that has turned you, you know, into the scholar you are, uh, born out of the, uh, a story your grandmother told you. Um, we should also point out that the Strausses weren't the only first-class Jews on board. Tell us the story of uh, the notable story that was depicted in James Cameron's film as well. Benjamin Guggenheim was heir to one of the great mining fortunes in this country. His father was a Swiss Jewish immigrant, and he was known as the the least motivated of Meyer Guggenheim's children. He was traveling home with his uh, mistress. Uh, his wife, Florette Zelligman, was, uh, uh, Guggenheim was still in New York with um, uh, their daughter, Peggy, who later became known as a great art collector. And Benjamin Guggenheim uh, sent off his, he, his mistress, Leontino Bear, got into a lifeboat. But then the steward famously urged Benjamin Guggenheim to uh, put on a life belt, and he refused. And instead, he and his valet, Victor Giglio, dressed in their evening dress, white tie and tails, and Benjamin Guggenheim said, we are dressed in our best and are prepared to go down like gentlemen. And uh, that became a famous story, too, of him upholding what was seen as a gentleman's code. And I will say that 
uh, Walter Lohr, the great uh, American author, who in many ways gave birth to American narrative popular history. I mean, David McCullough described Walter Lord as his great inspiration and mentor for the writing of A Night to Remember. Walter Lord said, essentially, I expected when I began researching the story that the rich people behaved poorly and the poor people behaved uh, wonderfully, and that was a story. And he said, actually, I found that some rich people behaved terribly, some behaved wonderfully, and same in third class or second class. There was this reaction. But I think the thing that grabs us about this disaster is what will we do when faced with these life and death situations? How we want people to remember us? What would we do for our families? Uh, that was like the big motivator within that compressed two and a half hour time period. When, when I watch it, that? when I watch those uh, men stand back from getting in the not full lifeboats, which of course is one of the the twenty, you know, the hindsight twenty twenty realizations that. You know, now they don't do women and children first because because those boats weren't full. They could have saved far more people if they had just allowed who was there to get on. Maybe the women a little bit first, but at least then start filling it with with uh, other people. <laughs> um, but it's it still is quietly horrific in watching the film. And I just recently rewatched Night to Remember, watching the men stand back and their faces and their wives' faces, not really quite understanding in that moment that this was the last of it. This was really goodbye. Because nobody really says goodbye, do they? Because they can't quite face the horror of it. No, I have to say that I rewatched the movie recently and there's that scene where that first class family um, gets in, uh, leaves their cabin and you see the unspoken dialogue between the husband and the wife in which the wife says, do we really have to wake the children up? Is it really necessary? And the husband said, yes, I believe we should do what the captain says. You can tell the woman is thinking, I know this is not good, but she does not panic. And they realize they have this unspoken communication that like what matters is we get the children off. And I have to say as a father of two boys of three and six and watching that scene again um, as a father, I'm like, how would I react? Would my wife and I have that same tacit communication where we like, I say, don't panic, look after your mother, say goodbye, but you don't want the kids to panic, but you need to get the kids off first. That's what you're thinking, that survival thing. We get, we get the moment in James Cameron's Titanic when Rose says mother. <laughs> you know, the ship is going to sink and there aren't enough boats. You know, half the, boat. the ship are going to die, not the better half, you know, which is a little sort of moustache twiddling from Cal. But um, it's half the people on the ship are going to die. She knew because she had, it had been, you know, communicated to her via Thomas Andrews. And so she did forth. the math. She did the math. As a, as a gentleman, I consider myself a gentleman, but as neither a woman nor a child, I tell you, I would not be standing back. I would be getting in a boat in some way. Uh, you can different call me a modern day though. Ismay, but it's I don't a, know about that. It was a different time. It yes, it is absolutely. Time. Gentlemen are of a different ilk. Stephen, do you consider Ismay to be the villain that history has painted him as? I don't consider, I think that what he did was extremely stupid. I think that he probably panicked. I think he uh, should have thought that uh, other men aren't doing it. Other men are not getting into the lifeboat. Uh, and he just did it um, while John Jacob Astor, Isidore Strauss and other people of his class did stay back. I think what he did was extremely foolish, especially since the, um, the designer, Thomas Andrews and the captain were staying on the ship. I think it was, I think he acted in a moment of panic. Uh, I think that uh, he was ultimately foolish uh, and he paid that price for the rest of his life as we all know. But I think that the contrast to him is <clears throat> Colonel Archibald Gracie, uh, who another first class passenger who like Ismay helped women and children get into the lifeboats, but what struck Gracie at the very end when he was like, we're going to make a run for it with his friend, Clinch Smith, he saw all these women and children, all of a sudden the last men who had been kept down below escaping 
on the deck, or suddenly showing up, coming out of the first class entrance. And he said, and he wrote in his, his memoir, uh, that the agony of seeing this, that we had not done our job, that in fact, there were lots of women and children uh, trapped below and who'd come out the last minute. And I think the ultimately damning statistic is that more first class men survive than first class children. And that alone should be something that should uh, be in the scales against Ismay since they were in his care, they're in his company's care. And as a, and I'm saying this once again, as biased as a parent, but like when you think of that statistic, that is inexcusable. It's, it's the ultimate form of denial as well. Imagine all the hubris that came up until that point, you know, get the engines going, get into New York, let's break some records, let's let's be let's be that ship that that does that for the first time. But to then shift gears within within an hour of, sh of hitting the iceberg that no, all of that is gone, all of that. So that, again, there's this, we know a lot more about sort of the psychology of when you're in a traumatic situation, how you it's slightly surreal. You don't really know that you're experiencing it until afterwards. And a parent like yourself would have experienced it in that way. And Isme is thinking about all the money and all the insurance. He's already just what a disaster. Well, money, That's exactly. And it's the, the business of steerage, like getting ferrying immigrants to America was was huge business. This was, uh, and and I, I was, I wrote down a fact that you, that you said steerage was only at seventy percent capacity, uh, and and for a lot of these ships, it was the steerage business that facilitated the luxury that the first class passengers were enjoying. Like there there wouldn't have been uh, uh, the luxury vacation for the for the first class had it not been for the business of steerage. And if, so if you can. Speak to that, and I'm also reading uh, that you mentioned only there were only 50 Jews. I mean, your book talks about this this second exodus that, you, that it, as you call it, but there were only 50 Jews. So I, I'd like to talk about the business of steerage, and, and also um, you know, anti-Semitism is back in the news today. Sadly, um, would the first class Jewish passengers like the Strausses and Guggenheim have faced anti-Semitism, or was first class kind of beyond that? I think on the Titanic, they did not face anti-Semitism. I think they were treated as paying customers. I think in third class, third class did have a kosher, a small kosher kitchen uh, that was about the size of a closet. There was a kosher chef named Charles Kettle from Southampton. The kosher kitchen was inspected by the rabbi of Southampton at, at every voyage on the White Star ships. and. The Titanic actually was kind of an odd ship when it came to the business model because the Hamburg America line ships in their hand, they sell directly out of Hamburg, um, maybe calling in, in Southampton or something briefly, but because they were closest to this, the greatest exodus of people leaving, Southern, leaving Eastern Europe, leaving the Russian Empire. So comparably sized Hamburg America line ships would have 2,500 in third class in steerage. Titanic only had capacity for a thousand. So the Hamburg America line ships were actually much more profitable in many ways. The Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic, uh, they only called at Cherbourg, France and at uh, Queenstown, Ireland. Now that's kind of far away from where most of European mass immigration is happening. So White Star was kind of at a competitive disadvantage um, in, in that market. But yes, it was a steerage was a very lucrative business. You charge the equivalent of eleven hundred dollars a head, very low, uh, very high margin. You don't provide, quote unquote, um, you know, super high quality food or what. Although the Titanic, her steerage or third class did have much better food than was and accommodations that were in the past. You had separate cabins for families, or not. that was an innovation actually borrowed from. The Hamburg America line, which Albert Ballin pioneered, separate cabins for families, some waiter service in the dining room if you paid a bit more money, uh, kosher food in the dining halls. So it was actually, in many ways, the White Star Line was borrowing what the German lines were, were doing, as well as the idea of the ships being outstanding floating hotels. That was a German invention, not a British one. 
And Frances Fisher even said in James Cameron's film, she says it to J uh, Jack Dawson about, I hear the third class accommodations are quite good on this ship. So uh, steerage passengers would have enjoyed uh, probably better, better accommodations than they would have on other lines. I, I did not know until I read your book that uh, Bruce Ismay was a second generation shipping magnet. I hadn't realized that he was the second Ismay. What do we know about the Ismay family dynasty uh, prior to him being born into the business? Yeah, well, this is very common in the shipping business, whether in the age of sail or in the early, in this era of steam. It happened among British families. It happened among the Hamburg um, elite um, shipping families who I write about in um, other sections of my book. I mean, Ismay's father was Thomas Ismay, who was your classic uh, bootstrapping uh hard knuckle businessman. He basically bought the bankrupt White Star Line in the 1860s on a, you know, for nothing, uh, for a, a thousand pounds. And he uh, partnered with a gentleman named Gustav Christian Schwabe, who was actually a converted Jew from Hamburg. And they partnered together to both build the White Star Line and uh, the Harlan Wolf shipping line. So this was a symbiotic business. So, uh, and also Schaub's nephew was named uh, Wolf, and that was the Wolf of, of Harlan and Wolf. So actually, Harlan and Wolf actually has a German Jewish connection, as does the White Star Line. But Ismay built this company from the ground up, and he introduced, um, you know, great luxury and first class, but his ships are also big steerage carriers. And he was um, absolutely a ruthless man. I think it was very tough on his son, Bruce. Bruce went to Harrow School, which is the same school that Winston Churchill went to. But instead of going on to college, I think Ismay was a sort of classic guy. I was like, you want to go to college and skylark your time away? No, you're going to come work for me. You're going to learn the real, you're not, you're not going to be some spoiled brat. You're going to come work for me right away. So I think the two of them had a kind of tough relationship. Uh, but I think Bruce Ismay, he was no idiot. I think he learned hard lessons from his dad on how to run a company. So, and it was he that sold the company after his father's death to JP Morgan's uh, firm for a handsome $32 million. So the White Star Line was actually the only real moneymaker in JP Morgan's IMM portfolio. So there's this, there's this myth that, oh, JP Morgan just wrote for the checks for the Titanic and her uh, two sisters. No, it came from the cash flow of the White Star Line. And JP Morgan got off uh, pretty lucky uh, in the fact that he was not on board that ship. Yes, he um, canceled the last minute, uh, supposedly to spend some more time with his mistress in France. But he, um, uh, I think, the, if I remember correctly, he was supposed to occupy one of the big B-deck suites, but then Jay Bruce Ismay took that suite instead. He was a taker, that Bruce Ismay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You know, you mentioned uh, your initial fascination with Titanic was because of the Strausses and the story your grandmother told you. How does your fascination with uh, all things Titanic or, or maybe all things shipping, ocean liner, how does that manifest itself? Have you been to the museum in Belfast? Did you go visit the, the Queen Mary in Long Beach? I mean, how do you recreationally satisfy uh, those desires and interests. Well, we, we've been lucky to go on. I've, I've spoken on a couple of cruises for for sea, uh, Seaborne Cruise Line, one of which was a transatlantic um, that went all the way up to Greenland. That was quite amazing. Uh, we as a family stayed a night in the, in the Queen Mary a few years ago before COVID. Um, I have um, a couple of pictures of my eldest son um, uh, running at full speed along the promenade deck. Um, and yeah, it's funny, as my, as a maritime author, I've received countless models of clipper ships and of the SS United States, and I have to turn them down because <laughs> there's only so many um, models you can have of a ship in your house before it gets a little out of control. But I will say that I do have behind me, when we visited Hamburg, when I was doing research in 2019, I uh, picked up a little model of, from the Hamburg Maritime Museum of the SS Vaterland, which was built in 1914 as the biggest ship in the world by the Hamburg America line. And uh, that was pretty amazing to go to Hamburg and see where so much maritime history happened too. I mean, this was a race, not just, pre White Star was not just building to race, to outdo Cunard. Their real rival were the Germans. 
and Albert Ballon, the Germans were building bigger and truly spectacular ships. They also made a ton of money. Are you are you a mariner yourself? Are you a sailor? Do you have a boat? Do you get out there on the water? I do not have a boat. I usually use other people's boats. Um, I've been on. I've been on a. <laughs> in 2013, I went on a seven day uh, sailing trip uh, to the Bahamas with two friends, and we managed to outrun a a water spout, which was interesting. But I could knock around in a sunfish. But the only boats that we actually own are um, uh, <laughs> two inflatable boats that we've used on the Brandywine Creek uh, occasionally. But yeah, I, I, I've I've also been sailing and. A few years ago, I went sailing in the San Francisco Bay, which was quite incredible on a friend's boat. And I was given the tiller. It's basically one of those things of do what the captain says. And we were heeling over pretty far and I had my head, legs dangling out over uh, <laughs> the choppy waters of San Francisco Bay underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. But that's just one of those moments as a where you just think, OK, just hang on and 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 do as you're told. You know, um cruises as as a holiday so when you when you when you go and you speak on those i don't i don't know like i i get very overwhelmed when i'm on a cruise ship and i i my i have such a rich fantasy life uh, are there are there places on your bucket list alexander and i talk a lot about um the titanic trail in cove ireland uh you know now that's renamed cove but I, I got to visit there and have a tour. Dr. Michael Martin is a, is a very gracious host. He created the Titanic Trail. Um, I would put that on any Titanic enthusiast's bucket list. Do you have a maritime bucket list? Well, I would like to do the um, the transatlantic um, on the Queen Mary too. That would be quite wonderful. Everyone I've spoken to says that's a very authentic experience. And you know, the ship is getting up there. 20 years is not young for a, a ship. I would love to do that. I've never been to um, Belfast. I would love to to visit the Belfast um, Titanic Museum, but um, yeah, my my it's funny. My my eldest son is interested in African animals, uh, especially warthogs. He's interested in um, in trolleys and trains. But now he's discovered the Titanic, and now he's very interested in that. So <laughs> oh, another one, uh, another one. I, have to, I do have another. to say, as as a parent, you have to be very. He read about it in the Magic Tree House, and as a parent, you sort of have to. It's, it's you have to you have to answer very difficult questions about like this is not just some ship striking an iceberg these are people here and how do you explain to a child um like the difficult stories that often go with history it's like how do you explain the titanic how do you but explain that's the very Holocaust? common We've done episodes on this about the the appeal of the Titanic story to young people and how it it draws children in uh, from an early age. I mean, present company included uh, in that. And yeah, there are difficult con conversations to be had, but that that's history for you. Um, and, and there were a couple of things that I even I, as I pride myself on my my own Titanic knowledge that I was not aware of. Now, if you the opening scene of Night to Remember the film, you know, it starts with uh, their, their christening Titanic with the champagne bottle. And I found out in your book that that was not the case, that, that there was actually not a lot of fanfare uh, when Titanic was was launched and, and released. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I wonder what the tradition came from, why they never did that. I remember reading somewhere there was some speculation that because Harlan and Wolf was originally a partly originally Jewish ownership, they didn't do that. Um, I don't know whether it was superstition, but um, yeah, it was it was the, as one builder, Harlan Wolf said, they just builds them and shoves them in. And I, I don't know what the, the, the logic was. I mean, JP Morgan was at the launch, uh, as was uh, J. Bruce Ismay. And tens of thousands of people from Belfast came to watch this. And I think that one thing that we have to remember from back then versus now is that people took such such pride of ownership who built this ship. I mean, this was something that they didn't just create as one historian said, this is not just some assembly line that was cranking out Liberty ships. Like this was a three and a half year long project. And when the ship went down, the, the builders wept. I mean, they had, they don't lose anyone. Well, actually they did, they lost, some members of the guarantee group, but you know, they weren't, their families weren't directly, they weren't on the ship, but they wept. And I think honestly, looking at today's culture where things are so disposable, I think there was that pride of like, we built this, I built this. And 
it was built to last 30 years the entire city worked on titanic you know they were riveters or they were carpenters or upholsterers or or whatever it was so you know for a long time it wasn't just a a factory punching out 10 titanics a, a year or something and and we've we've learned on our uh, conversations is that belfast was didn't want to talk about titanic for many many years it was in it it was a, a a source of shame that that ship had not survived and and always sort of came back to belfast until they built the museum when they were discussed do we really need a museum commemorating this dreadful part of our city's history and now it is the city people go to belfast because they are excited to learn more about that ship and stand in the slipway and and walk onto the nomad and and it's it's kind of turned around but at the beginning or for many many decades they were not they were not fessing up to it or not leaning into it no it's just trauma i think it's like a lot of things it's 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 something that you know i mean imagine i guess the closest analogy would be i mean it's not the Titanic is no Chartres Cathedral, but still, I think it's comparable in terms of the, the city comes together to build a cathedral, and it's and it took you know it takes a hundred years to build a cathedral, so it's not nowhere close to the Titanic, but still, there's that feeling of like you build it and then you and then it's it's you there it. for everyone to see. It's yes. there and willed into reality, something that we don't understand when, in our digital age. Uh, so yeah, I can understand that. The and irony that, is the Titanic's tragedy is the reason why it's still, it's still a topic of conversation. If it had arrived safely in New York, we wouldn't be talking about it today. No. It, it wouldn't it have been it just another big white star line. Now you mentioned, and I, 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 you'll correct my pronunciation if it's Mackay or McKay, the McKay Bennett, um, you mentioned that it, it, it was there not just to retrieve the dead bodies why did they you know it wasn't just a recovery mission uh, tell us about that please sure i mean this is one of the really in talk about trauma this was the a cable ship that was rented by the white star line to retrieve uh, bodies from the wreck site and she arrived about a week after the ship went down and this was done for two reasons it was done because there were very wealthy passengers who who perished and the families wanted to reclaim the bodies and i think the other kind of creepier reason is that the steamship companies didn't want all these dead corpses floating in the ocean because it was the North Atlantic Seaway and there were ships coming and going and the last thing that people wanted to see was to clean up dead bodies mess. floating in the water. So they were, you know, over, the crew was overwhelmed by the number of bodies. They only got 300 or so. But I think the really sad thing that happened is that like they basically differentiated the corpses based on class. And they thought, oh, we can tell who is a first class, who's second class, who's third and crew. And basically, you know, people like Isidore Strauss, John Jacob Astor, they were recovered. Uh, Ida Strauss, sadly, was never recovered. But uh, they said, uh, and they would identify them by, uh, you know, their, they got their wallet or something. Uh, but uh, even after death, uh, first class passengers were put in coffins and embalmed. Second class passengers were put in ice. And those thought to be crew or steerage, a crew or steerage were buried at sea, thrown overboard. Uh, and it's really sad. Uh, there was one Jewish passenger named Galinsky who was found, and uh, he was buried at sea. And the irony was he was he was a Russian Jew who had spent some time in England. He was sent over by his family to um, establish a family beachhead in, Ch in Chicago. He was a locksmith. They found his body, he was in his thirties. And uh, you know they threw him overboard and oddly enough, gave him a Anglican burial service. And then they also found the body of um, uh, another immigrant named Sinai Kantor, who was traveling second class. He and his wife had saved some money and they had in the hold uh, several trunks of Russian furs, which they intended to sell to finance their dentistry studies. Um, Miriam Cantor survived the disaster. She took up a she was some friends took up a collection from the American Red Cross and she was able to go to dentistry school. Uh, Sinai's body was found and on his body was a silver watch that had a image of Moses receiving the, the, the Ten Commandments on one side and a watch face and Hebrew characters in another and that was recovered and oddly enough recently sold. But um, that I was, saw that 
Um, Simon Medhurst's Instagram page. I saw I saw that uh, that watch uh, that was recently sold. I mean, it's. I, I, what is your opinion about um, in terms of like bringing up artifacts from the ship? I mean, there, there there are pros and cons to this. Do you have an opinion about that? I mean, what's done is done. I mean, it's already been. I'm I'm I. I kind of go with Eva Hart's idea that it's a gravesite and it should be left alone. And by the way, Eva Hart, she was you know one of the most famous survivors. She had a a Christian mother and a Jewish father, and and uh, they I think you know, she they were traveling to immigrate to America, and uh, she was a British originally, but you know, she said it's like this is a gravesite. This is a uh, you, you don't or as Robert Ballard said, you it's like taking belt buckles from the Arizona. There's something kind of macabre about it, but unfortunately what's done is done. You can't undo uh, what's been salvaged. So at this point, in principle, I'm against it, but you know, it's too late now. So interesting. And you, you, you talk about the, uh, the funerals and, and the disposition of the, of the victims. Uh, and I, I was thinking, I was rewatching, I don't remember, I was rewatching, it was either Night to Remember or the Barbara Stanwyck Titanic version. And there were the Strausses singing Nearer My God to Thee. And I thought they probably wouldn't know the lyrics to Nearer no, My God to Thee. I don't think they thee. would have done but that. When... I think they were pretty observant <laughs> Jews. So they, were, they wouldn't have done that. So. But their memorial service, you write, uh, was at Carnegie Hall and attended by over 6,000 people. I mean, the, the, the public mourned the Strausses. There were dignitaries. There were just average New Yorkers. They were they were really mourned. Uh, and you have to wonder, you know, do we, other than Brangelina, who do we have in today's society that, uh, that would be so loved? Uh, and we, of course, have the Strauss Memorial on the Upper West Side. It, it, Let's let's finish the conversation where we began it. Your your love for Titanic came out of the Strauss story. Um, what's the Strauss's legacy? I mean, it's the Strauss's legacy. They're immensely philanthropic. They were they like a lot of Jewish immigrants. They came in an earlier wave with the German Jews in the eighteen forties and fifties. Uh, they were they became. It's interesting. Isidore Strauss initially spent time in Georgia, so kind of like the Lehman Brothers, they had some dabblings with the. He had some dabblings with the Confederacy, but then he uh, moved up to New York and opened a crockery department in Macy's department store. Then eventually, he and his brother bought the whole thing out, and they were extremely generous uh, in philanthropy to uh, Jewish causes. Uh, they were respected by both. Jews and Gentiles and in, in high society, they kind of bridged the gap. They're members of uh, Temple Emanuel. They're very close friends with the banker, Jacob Henry Schiff. And they were just known to be very kind, very considerate, thoughtful people. I mean, the fact that Andrew Carnegie was extremely close with them and gave uh, one of the eulogies uh, and uh, members of the Jewish and Gentile elite were there at their funerals. And they were poor Jews standing outside Carnegie Hall in the rain. It's, it's, it's an immensely moving story that she could have saved her life, but she said it was not worth living her life without Isidore. And the public responded to that. They still do respond to that. Um, and that memorial on the Upper West Side near the former side of their house is one of the most beautiful pieces of sculpture in New York. And I think mm -hmm. that is an example, the Strausses of noble behavior in the face of tragedy. There was a lot of bad behavior that night, but that is a that was a shining light in a, in a very dark few hours. Let's end it with that. Stephen, we're so grateful to you. We highly recommend the book, The Last Ships from Hamburg, and your other books, which I am excited to read as well. Uh, you are uh, now a treasured member of the Titanic Talk family. We're so oh, grateful. I learned so much. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this, hit the subscribe button. For information on where you can see Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries, go to shipofdreamsfilm.com. Titanic Talk is a production of Ship of Dreams Film Limited. To celebrate Season 2 of Titanic Talk, we've launched a line of Titanic Talk merch. A cap, a mug, a tote, a t-shirt or a hoodie? You'll be sure to find a unique gift for the Titaniac in your life. Look for the link in the notes and on Instagram or go to bit.ly forward slash Titanic Talk shop. 
And Nelson has a new book out. Dancing Between the Raindrops is a steamy page turner full of all the tales Nelson can still remember from New York City in the 1980s. It's a coming of age story about friends in the era of big hair, padded shoulders, and punk rock. Dancing Between the Raindrops is available on Amazon or ask for it at your local bookstore.